Secretary General Antonio Guterres, so good to see you again. It's a great pleasure to be here. As the Secretary General, I mean, you are the man who is most aligned with global leadership, with multilateralism. And so I have to say, from my perspective right now, when I look at climate change, when I look at the response to the pandemic, when I look at Afghanistan, it doesn't feel great right now. The trajectory feels pretty bad on all of those issues. How do you respond to that in your position? Well, we are facing a number of dramatic challenges. A virus is defeating us as an international community. Climate change, uh, we are far from the consensus that is needed between developed and developing countries to really be able to get to net zero in 2050. And at the same time, we see this multiplication of crises uh, uh, all over the world. We are going in the wrong direction in all these aspects. We see a geopolitical divide uh, that is becoming deeper and deeper. The geopolitical divide today is such that in crucial areas like vaccine equity or climate action, we do not see the international community united, especially because the big powers are not united. The big powers are deeply divided. And this is a dramatic situation. Now, look at COVID. I mean, in my country, 80% of the population is vaccinated. Many African countries have 2% of the population vaccinated. We see mutations all the time. We see variants all the time. Now they speak about variants that might be able to be immune to vaccines. So as the COVID is spreading like wildfire in the developing countries, we risk to make the vaccines that are essentially available to developed countries useless. This is a suicide. I mean, look at climate. When we've seen what happened in Germany, when we've seen what happened in Canada with the heat waves, when we see what's happening with the glaciers in Greenland and the high level uh, and the level of the seas rising, when we see Antarctica being put into question. I mean, it is clear that we are facing a disaster in climate change. But at the present moment, there is a lack of trust between developed countries and developing countries, especially emerging economies. It is clear emerging economies need to be more, namely on coal, but it is clear developed countries must abide by the commitments they made in Paris, namely to mobilize 100 billion US dollars uh, uh, in support to developing countries, both to reduce emissions and to support their population in resilience, in building better infrastructure, being able to resist to these horrible events uh, uh, that climate change is creating. Now, we need to rebuild trust between developed countries and developing countries if we want to rescue COP26. And the worst thing that could happen to us is this mistrust going on, the developed countries not being able to meet their commitments, developing countries, especially emerging economies, not being able to reduce emissions as much as needed, and we will get in some aspects to tipping points. So what and happened? then it's irreversible. Well, what happened? I mean, talking specifically about COP26 and, and your first term as Secretary General has been at least as much about climate as anything else. Biden becomes president. For the first time ever, John Kerry, a cabinet appointee for climate change, he knows the issue, he has the network. The US rejoins Paris Climate Accord. And yet right now, everything I hear is that COP26 is actually set up to fail. What happened? There was a time in which the fact the United States was engaged in an important international issue, that would mean that issue could be solved. The fact the US was engaged on an issue would mean that the whole world would become engaged on that issue. We are no longer in that situation. Today, no issue can be solved without the United States. And so without the United States on climate action, we were doomed. But the fact the United States are on climate action is not enough. Because today, the largest emitter is not the United States, it's China. China. And today, the emerging economies represent a, a very large percentage. And the emerging economies, of course, can blame the developed countries, saying, well, but you have been polluting for decades and decades, and now you want us to do an extra effort. And they need to do that extra effort. But to do that extra effort, developed countries must show that they also will do what they were supposed to do, namely, in financial and technical support to developing countries. And what we see now is this lack of capacity for a dialogue to come together and to understand that each one needs to give something. 
And everybody, it's like the chicken and the egg. Now everybody is waiting for the other side. I've been telling the, our English friends that preside the COP, we need to bring together the G7 on one side, Brazil, China, India, South Africa on the other side, and create a situation in which both understand that we are in a very, very dangerous situation. Because there are some tipping points we are very close to reach, which means a little bit more time and 1.5 degrees will not be a possibility as maximum increase in the amount of temperature, which means we are on the verge of the abyss. And one thing it is clear, if you are on the verge of an abyss, you must be careful about your next step. And if COP26 does not become a success, if we are not able to cope with this challenge and finally bring the countries together, I mean, we need to make these countries understand this is the moment for an historical compromise. And whatever divisions they have, whatever geostrategic problems they have, whatever completely different visions they have on human rights, the question is, it is the survival of humanity, it is the survival of the planet, and we need to come together. For right now, when we talk about climate and the COP26, is it fundamentally a US-China breakdown that's no. causing the problem? No, it's a developed world versus developing and in particular emerging economies. Because emerging economies are already too important to be neglected. We need them also to make an extra effort, but for that extra, extra effort to be possible, uh, we must have a lot of support from the developed world. Coal, for instance. I've been advocating for no more coal power plants uh, and for the phase out of coal until 2030 for OECD countries, until 2040 for all the other countries. But it's true that several economies are completely dependent on coal and we need to help them create a transition. And for that, they need financial and technical support. Countries like Indonesia, like Vietnam, not to mention China and India themselves. I mean, so we need to have a kind of a global alliance to solve the coal problem, in which everybody needs to contribute, but we are not yet there. We need to raise the alarm because world leaders need to wake up. And as you know, it is possible to sleepwalk into a conflict and it is possible to sleepwalk into a disaster in climate. Has COVID over the last two years made it more challenging? for the climate agenda to move forward? To a certain extent, yes, and to a certain extent, no. To a certain extent, yes, because obviously, COVID also generated a lot of mistrust between developed and developing countries. I mean, vaccine inequity doesn't help to build trust. Uh, the fact that developed countries are today mobilizing about 28% of GDP to recover their economies and they have the resources for that. Middle-income countries, probably about 6% of their GDP. Low-income countries probably about 2% of their very small GDP. Uh, the fact that you have huge debt problems that are not properly addressed in the developing world. This inequity in relation to vaccines and in relation to recovery doesn't help to build trust. So obviously the COVID has created an environment that does not facilitate the countries coming together because they didn't come together effectively on the COVID. But at the same time, the COVID demonstrated our enormous fragility. I mean, it's a virus that is defeating. We are more than one year and a half after it started. And look at the United States, it's getting worse again. I mean, this is almost unimaginable. You have one wave, another wave, a third wave. I mean, it's, we are extremely fragile as a planet and as societies. And we have many other problems in our societies, as we know, mistrust between people and institutions, all the problems the democratic societies are facing. Uh, many talk about the end of truth, the scientific evidence is being put into question. So we have plenty of problems. But at least in relation to climate, less and less people are in climate denial. More and more people understand it's necessary to do, but we are not yet there. And even this increased conscience of fragility that the COVID brought is, has not yet allowed to wake up our, some, or at least many of our most powerful leaders. As someone who talks to all of these leaders all the time, how have your perceptions changed of the Americans in the world, 
and of the Chinese role in the world over the last, over your first term as Secretary? I think the two countries have evolved enormously uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the United States moved from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, and that of course represents a totally different view to look into governance. And I think that um, there is a, a serious effort uh, to make uh, lying wrong again. Uh, in the American society, which is a positive thing. But uh, we know that these things uh, are always fragile. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the truth is that China has become much more assertive about uh, its uh, economic weight and much more conscious about uh, its role. And this has created, this evolution uh, have created a basic uh, misunderstanding about the two countries. And uh, I've been saying since the beginning, it is clear for me that there is a clear divide in relation to human rights and a clear divide in relation to some geostrategic issues, namely the South China Sea. It is clear to me that there is an area there where there should be convergence, climate, climate, and there are areas where there should be a serious negotiation. There are differences, but uh, I mean, I don't want to see the world divided into two. I don't want to see a decoupling, a global decoupling, economic and technological. I think it's, it, it would be good to have one single economy uh, with one single set of rules. But this requires a serious negotiation because obviously things uh, have evolved. Uh, so obviously we need, we need a redesign uh, that, is, that requires a serious negotiation. The problem is that we had the division exacerbated on the questions of human rights and the questions and the geostrategic questions, that was inevitable. And we also had a division on all questions related to trade and technology. And so the only thing in which there is an area of potential convergence is climate. climate. And you said yourself, it used to be the United States could do the driving, now it needs other actors. Increasingly, it used to be the states that could do the driving. Now, increasingly, it's also the big companies that are needed as well. Could you see a future where major cities, metropolitan areas, major corporations, major banks actually had envoys to the United Nations, could become signatories to international treaties? I would say treaties, by definition, today are treaties among states. Yes. But we can find other instruments in which I believe the contribution of the private sector, the contribution of civil society can be incorporated. I think we need to have the, the capacity to reimagine the way international cooperation was established. Of course, we still need intergovernmental bodies and governments have the legitimacy to represent their, their countries. But the truth is that power is less and less the monopoly of governments and it's more and more distributed in society and power in the private sector, private power in the financial sector, of course, as always in the past, power in the civil society, power in movements that, I mean, sometimes we see all of a sudden coming out of nothing and with social media, etc., gain an enormous importance in countries. And so we need to have multilateral institutions in which cities have a word to say and regions have a word to say, in which the private sector has a strong contribution to give, in which the civil society must be the environment in which uh, new things are generated to force governments to move, and to have a multilateralism that is inclusive. So a couple other questions before we close. On Afghanistan, are we heading towards civil war right now in that country? Let's hope not, but there is a lot of unpredictability. And I think the international community has some leverage. First, the Taliban wants recognition. Second, there are sanctions that they want to see disappearing. And third, they need international financial support. I mean, uh, and at the present moment, as you know, the accounts of Afghanistan are frozen by the United States. The IMF and World Bank are not providing any resource. There is a serious cash problem in the country. Uh, so, I mean, there is leverage. But it would be necessary for all the elements of the international community to come together and to engage with the Taliban positively, because I think we need to engage with the reality that is there, but at the same time to provide the Taliban the idea that they can become part of a normal world if they are able to do a number of things that are the things I've described. It's not yet clear the international community will be able to do so. What we decided to do as UN was to make a bet that if we are able to prove to the Taliban that we can in relation to humanitarian aid, support the people of Afghanistan effectively, which also they need, obviously, 
I think we gain leverage to be able to obtain from them conditions for us to work properly, which means impartial uh, distribution of aid to everybody, which means women allowed to work, which means that the girls can go to school and things of this sort. So what I decided to do, because I mean, I have no army, I have no financial power, what I decided to do, I sent uh, my Under Secretary uh, General on Humanitarian Affairs, that corresponds to, I would say, a ministerial level, and he was the first person at ministerial level that went to Kabul, and uh, Qatar was instrumental in allowing that to happen. He went there a few days ago. He met uh, with the uh, key uh, Taliban um, leaders, uh, and we tried to establish a platform to see how humanitarian aid and the conditions to make it acceptable could work. All the countries, they are ready to support humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. Many are not ready to do many other things. Did that meeting make you feel that the Taliban is prepared to act more pragmatically in order to maintain that was some the level message of conveyed by the Taliban. But if there is something about Afghanistan that uh, uh, I am totally convinced is that the situation is still unpredictable. You know, when you and I talk, we always are talking about challenges on the global stage. I'm wondering, what's a surprise that you feel optimistic about that isn't in the headlines right now. Can be small, can be big. No, the only thing that makes me optimistic is to see young people um, that are more cosmopolitan and that uh, feel that they are citizens of the world. And I hope that this will contribute for uh, the need to be constantly waking up political leaders not to be necessary anymore from some time onwards. Antonio Gutierrez, Secretary General, great to see you. It was a great pleasure to be here.